morning, everybody. Welcome once again to our Sunday morning time together here at the Digital Cathedral. I trust you have your Bible, your coffee's hot, and you're ready to rock and roll for the next 45 minutes or so. This morning, I want to take some time and talk about prayer. This is one of the things that I'm asked most often about uh, through the lens of grace. You know, the question is, how do we pray? Jesus said in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, he said, men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Now that sounds like a pretty tall order because he said men ought always to pray, always. That means continually pray. Have you ever got hung up on that and wondered how in the world you could pray continually or beyond that with the new understanding that you've come into, how, how do you pray in the light of grace and the finished work of the cross and an understanding of what you possess in Christ. So what I wanna do is I wanna take our time this morning and perhaps next week, I'll just tell you, we'll probably do this two weeks, and I wanna to talk to you about prayer as it relates to embracing our divinity or let's talk about how does grace pray? How does the finished work pray? How do, how do we pray with this understanding that we have come into? And I would be the first person to tell you that my understanding of prayer, my outlook on prayer, how I pray has changed a lot over the last few years. I've come to see prayer in an entirely different light, entirely different light than I did a few years ago. And I'll shoot you straight this morning. I'm still growing in my understanding of prayer. I'm still growing in my understanding on how to utilize this tool that we have called prayer. I've always been a prayer, no question about it. I've always been one that prays. I generally, for years and years, always had a set time to pray, you know, when I would just block off everything and I would have that time to pray. Maybe some of you, that was your prayer life also. And as I thought about it this week, I listed down, this is, this is astounding, I listed down 11 types of prayer that I used to pray. And I don't think I pray any of these 11 anymore. Let me just run through it. Th those of you that have been involved in church all of your life or you were into it as deep as I, I was, you probably have utilized most, if not all, of these 11 types of prayer. For example, let me, let me just list these for you. I don't have time to, to, to you know, go into a big explanation, but I think you'll recognize them if you have been a person that prays. I would pray prayers of supplication. Prayers of supplication are when we let God know all the needs that we have. And that's, that probably encompasses 99% of the prayer time of most people and telling God what we need. Make God aware of the needs we have. I prayed intercessory prayers. That's where we pray for others in other circumstances, the things that they're facing in life, but intercession is the whole idea that I'm praying for something that is not me. I'm praying for somebody or something else. Then we did a lot of spiritual warfare prayer. You know, that's where we came against the devil and evil and demons and territorial spirits, and we would take authority over them in the name of Jesus, and we would spend hours sometimes in spiritual warfare prayer. We would pray prayers of agreement. That's where two or more of us would agree on the same thing and pray in the same light or the same understanding. I had times of corporate prayer. When I was a pastor, I used to do these a lot. We would call corporate prayer. If we were facing something in the church or there was something going on in the world, then we would uh, go into corporate prayer. We had a prayer room in our church and we would call everybody into the prayer room that could come and we would join together in a time of corporate prayer. And there are even times within a city where <clears throat> other churches will come together and unite uh, here in, in Houston or in Katy, which is just outside Houston, there's one time a year that all the churches come together and have a time of what they call corporate prayer. I would pray prayers number six of thanksgiving. That's, that would just be times that you would thank God for all that he's done and all that he has blessed you with. We would have prayer vigils. A prayer vigil is where you might pray all night long. People would come together and just pray over needs and problems and requests for a specific period of time. Then of course we had times of prayer and fasting. That's where we wouldn't eat. We might drink liquids, uh, water or soups or juices, but we would set a time of prayer and fasting where we would not eat, not eat solid food. Uh, and then we would spend a lot of time in prayer. We had prayers of petition where we would ask God's favor on certain things that we were facing. Number 10, we prayed scripture, found a lot of good scripture to pray, and we would pray that as our prayer. 
And number 11, those of you that are going way back, I had to throw this one in because I spent probably five years doing this. Larry Lee, back in the 80s, had a program that he called Could You Not Terry One Hour? And that program was to take the Lord's Prayer section by section. We would pray our Father and we would pray over all the names of the Father. He's Jehovah Sid Canu, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shama, all of the several names that God would pray. Uh, he's our presence, our provider, our healer, and we would, would pray those <clears throat> as, our, as our prayer. Now, all 11 of these types of prayer had one thing in common, and that was to use our efforts to affect some kind of change. And what we, we kind of felt like, and I felt like many times, is that when I would come into prayer, that I had done my part, and now that it was God's part, to answer based on my requests. And my requests were always based on what I perceived to be the need, the problem, the dilemma, uh, what it was that was setting in front of us at the time. And I had kind of this concept, this mental idea that God was in heaven, which was beyond Pluto somewhere, didn't have an idea where the kingdom was, but it was out there someplace, and that I'm here on earth, and I need to get him to be aware of my situations, my problems, my dilemmas, as if he didn't know, make him aware of how, how you know, and I would argue my case in prayer the best that I could to get him to come from where he was to where I am, to do for me what I could not do. <clears throat> Sound familiar? I felt that prayer was based on my faith. If something didn't happen, then my faith was small. My faith failed. I, I didn't have enough faith. Or uh, my spiritual life needed to be updated. There were things in my life that needed to go. There were sins that I was committing that I needed forgiveness for. Something was wrong because God never failed on his part, right? That was our concept. God never failed on his part. So there must be a failure on my end someplace, which creates tremendous condemnation and guilt and shame uh, if, if we don't if we don't get the answer. Or of course, then we always said there were three ways that God would answer prayer. Because we didn't know any different, we said he would either answer yes, no, or not now. So my job is a prayer. Let me say it again, my job is a prayer. And that understanding that I had of prayer was to see what I needed to have done, what needed to be done, and pray about it. And then his job, based on my prayer, my faith, was to get her done. That was his job. He, had, he was the get her done guy. I was the request guy, and he was the get her done guy. So that's how I, I spent a lot of years in prayer. I needed to make sure during that time, however, after I made requests, and Bob are in heaven with the with, um, you know, like a lawyer laying out what he needed and laying out his case. I needed then to make sure I didn't faint, that I didn't lose heart, that I didn't give up, I didn't get discouraged, because doggone it, you know, the Bible says in due season you'll reap if you don't faint. Now, can I just tell you, honestly, a, a real confession? That way of praying is nothing but friggin' exhausting. I would be exhausted with my prayer life. It would so consume me at times that there would be nothing else that I could really get done because of how much I was putting in to my prayer efforts. I've come to understand now, and I'm gonna unwind this for two weeks, and I'm gonna help some of you with this. This may, this may shake your world a little bit, but that's, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to shake you now and then. I've come to understand that a good word for prayer is the word communion. It's the word communion. It's the sharing and the exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings with the Father on a spirit-to-spirit -spirit level, all right? And it's in that exchange that I find my oneness with Him. I find my place of union with the isness of the Father or in His presence now. The presence of God is never was or gonna be. Presence of, is always now. It's is. Is is always now. And there's a passage of scripture that, that lays this out pretty well. And I want to read it to you from the Passion Translation. 
I'm going to kind of hop between a couple different translations this morning, but the Passion Translation lays out 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It lays it out really well, and I think, I think this gets down to the essence of communion with the Father. Prayer is communion. It's having that intimate time of talking. It's not where you have to sit down, get on your knees and pray. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that. I'm not telling you don't do it. I'm just saying that real prayer is communion. It's a spirit to spirit connection. And I'm going to I'm going to dive deep on this in a few minutes. So I want you to hold on. Just catch it. I want you to see the spirit to spirit. And and Paul lays it out well here. And he says in in verse and, and let me just read verses from, uh, let me pick it up in verse 11 down through verse 14, okay? And it says, after all, who can really see into a person's heart and know his hidden impulses except for the person's spirit? So there are things, that really, you don't know what you need. You don't know what your real requests are. Your re my, my prayer requests are, were always based on what my senses told me, what I could see, what I feel, what I, what I, what I thought, what, what I would observe, right? That's, if, if I observed the church checkbook and it was down, then that was the need. But that's not what Paul, Paul, right off the bat, says, no one can really see into a person's heart and know his hidden impulses except the person's spirit. So the only thing that really knows what needs to be done is my spirit, my spirit. So it is with God. His thoughts and secrets are fully, only fully understood by the Spirit, the Spirit of God. So the only thing that really searches the heart of the Father is the capital S Spirit. The only thing that knows my, my heart is the small s, my Spirit. Now watch. For we did not receive the Spirit, small s, of the world, of the world system, but the Spirit, capital S, of God, so that we might come to understand and experience, we might come to understand and experience what his lavishness through his grace has given to us. And we articulate these realities with the words implanted in us by the capital S Spirit and not with the words taught by human wisdom. My prayer life was based on human wisdom. Come on now, let's get real. What our minds told us, that's what we, we, we would pray. So, let me, let, let, let me just back it up here. Verse 13. And we articulate these realities with the words imparted to us by the capitalist spirit. The spirit tells us what to pray and not with the words taught by human wisdom. We join together spirit revealed truths with spirit revealed words. So it's the spirit that's going to reveal to me what it is I actually need to say. Someone living on an entirely human level rejects the revelation of God's spirit. Spirit's going to tell you how to, how to pray, how to articulate it, what to do, but a person that's living by the systems of the world isn't even in tune to that, has no clue about what they should do. He cannot understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are discovered by the illumination or the light of the Spirit. Are you still with me? All right. What, what is the isness of the Father? What, when I say what is this? Do you understand what I'm talking about here? Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the Father is in all things. The Father is in every situation. The Father is in every circumstance. Your praying is not to get him to come from someplace beyond Pluto to come to earth to meet what you can't do for yourself. He's always, He's already there. You're facing something. Maybe the doctor's giving you a bad report. Can I tell you that the Father is in the middle of that report? He is in the middle of, of your life to handle that. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is about a connecting of his isness, and I don't want to jump too far ahead. It's about connecting his isness with your isness, right? Connecting his isness with your isness. There is never a time, there's never a situation, let me assure you this morning, never a time or a situation that he lacks isness. Isness is always in the now, always now. It never was or gonna be, the Father is. And I'm gonna give you some of what he is in just a minute. Maybe another good word for isness would be the word omnipresence. The word omnipresence means that God is ever present. There's no place that he isn't. He fills every space, every void, every person. 
But something about omnipresence doesn't give me that sense of intimacy that isness does. So prayer brings us. Here's what prayer does. Here's what communion does. It brings us into the realization of the full awareness of the Father's continual indwelling presence in me, in my situation, in my life, in my dilemmas, in my circumstances. He is already there. He's already actively participating in everything that I face. All right, let's look at, let's look at a passage from, from John chapter 14. Jesus, Jesus said it just a little bit different, and maybe this, this will resonate. I, I love what Paul said in, that, uh, in Corinthians. Here's how Jesus put it. John chapter 14, and let me pick it up with verse 16 down through 19. Jesus said, now pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, the word helper there actually means one that's called alongside, one that walks with you. That's, that's what the word there is. The word paraclete in Greek means one that's called alongside, one that walks with you every step of the way. He, he doesn't uh, go home at the end of the eight-hour shift and leave you to yourself for the other 16 hours. He walks with you. You go to the emergency room, he's walking with you. He's with you. He's always there. Watch, that he may abide with you forever. So there's no separation. There's no time when you have to beg, plead, or ask God for his presence because the helper is continually on the job. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, capital S, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Natural uh, abilities did not pick up on this. It doesn't see. See, that's a natural, that's a natural thing. Or knowledge, knowing. You don't know him by gnosis knowledge but you know him watch for he dwells with you he dwells with you and will be in you man that's no separation right there can can you get that if you get nothing more out of this lesson today about your prayer life it's that you're not praying out there your pr prayer goes within it's it's within verse 18 i will not leave you orphans i can leave you alone i can leave you by yourself I will come to you a little while, and the world will see me no more. See, the world does, has no concept of where, where this all works. But you will see me because I live, you will, you, you will live also. So we don't, we don't, Jesus said, we don't grab this by, by intellectual knowledge of this. But, it, but through prayer, through spirit-to-spirit -spirit contact, this thing becomes, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I have prayed. Uh, when I'm teaching you this Sunday, next Sunday, I've been working, I've been doing this for uh, 17 years now. I've totally abandoned my old way of prayer. I do not have a set time of prayer. I have a conversation that lasts all day from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. It's, I, I don't mean there are not breaks in it. Of course, there. I take phone calls, I call people, I talk to people. But when I, when I am by myself, it's like automatically I got this contact. If I'm facing something, automatically got this contact. All right? It's a spirit to spirit. And it becomes more real to you than 2 plus 2 equals 4. Prayer is about awareness. Prayer is about consciousness. It's about oneness, oneness with what he is. So... For me, the best way to explain it is having a running conversation with the Father. And you don't have to articulate it. You don't have to use words. It can be spirit to spirit. Your spirit can, can just say, Father, here we go. I'm looking at this thing here. Father, I, need, uh, I ask you to just uh, show me what roads to take to get to that appointment. What's the best way? What's the best route? He's, if it concerns you, it concerns him. You don't have to talk him into it. If it concerns you, if it's important to you, it's important to him. He dwells within you. Your life is his life. His life is your life. So to, to, to grasp your union with divinity, we've got to, through communion, understand what he is. And you have to understand that what he is, you is. There's no difference in the isness. What he is, you is. You're a chip off the old block. Everything that he is, you is. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, let me just illustrate it for you. I'm going to walk you through four of what he is and four of what you is, and I want you to see they join together, that what he is becomes part of what you is, and that's what the prayer time becomes. It's a sharing, it's a sharing together. 
It's not, it's not requesting needs and hammering heaven to lay out your case like an attorney that will get God to come do for you what you can't do. Now just stay, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. All right, let, let me just walk you through four of what, he, what the Father is, <clears throat> what God is. All right, first one is this, God is light. God is light. The word, the word light in, in the Greek is the word phos, P-H-O-S. It means illumination. It means the ability to see. In 1 John chapter, uh, in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 5, it, it says this. Now just hold, stay with me. This, okay, this is good. This, this is going to help some of you this morning. I absolutely know this. 1 John, because some of you don't know how to pray. You really aren't praying anymore at all. You're not having communion because you know the prayer petition, the prayer of intercession, the corporate prayer, all that stuff. It never affected anything. But I'm telling you, what I'm teaching you is going to turn you upside down in, from inside out. We're affecting change within. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him. And we declare to you, God is light. God is light. God is light. Do you, can, can you get that? And in him, listen, listen, in him is no darkness at all. There's absolutely no darkness in him. No darkness. No darkness at all. God's solution to darkness, and this is where you've been jacked up, messed up. God's solution to darkness is, is not to fight it. God's solution to darkness is turn the light on. He is light. In him there is no darkness. Light, we, we could interpret light to mean truth. It can mean illumination. It can mean a creative force that brings order out of chaos. You remember when, when God created, there was darkness covered the whole earth, and then light came. Light was a creative force. The isness of God is light, and there is no darkness in that light. So I'm going to show you in just a minute that you have the same light that he has. All of his isnesses are contained within you. God is light. All right, let me give you another one. God is, God is life. God is life. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and uh, let's read one verse there. Acts chapter 17 and verse 25. This is Paul talking to the idol worshipers on Mars Hill. These people, these people have no awareness of uh, Jesus' father, of the God that Paul served. And he says something to them. He says, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Watch, watch this. You should, if you have your Bible, underline this. Since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. I want you to notice that. He gives to all life. He gives everybody life. There is no life source outside of him. And the word, the word life there is actually the word zoe. It's his life. He makes, you know what Paul said? This, this will blow the religious mind. This, this will cause you to get blocked on Facebook. He has taken his life and given it to every person. It's not when you pray for it or ask for it. See, this is, there's been so much separation in our thinking, so much separation in our praying. And Paul is trying to bring them into the reality that he is life, and the life that he has given has been directly deposited into every person. The isness of God is life, and in him there is no death. There is no death in Zoe. Honestly, you have no death in you. All you have is a continual working of life. And this strength of this life is going to work eternally. It's never going to stop. It's never going to let up. It's going to grow. It's going to ex exponentially get more powerful. The life that he gives to all is void of death. You are never going to die. Well, what about the scripture says that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment? Well, you died your death when you were crucified with Christ. There is no more death for you. No more, no more death for humanity. We were crucified with him, buried, resurrected, and ascended with him. Death has no part in Zoe. God is life. All right, number three, God is love. You know that one. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 says that God is, God is love. And when we walk in that love, we have uh, fellowship with one another. 
And let, let me just read it for you, because uh, I, I don't. I, I want you to catch all of these God is's because they're important to your life. First John chapter four and verse uh, six sixteen. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Watch. We have known. We've experienced this love. John said, "We we've known it. We've experienced it. We know what it is, and believe." the love that God has for us. The whole word is agape, all the way through. Nothing but agape has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now, that's that's an awareness thing, right? We, we He has, he's, he's deposited his life, his love, all that he is, into every person. So as you experience it, as you know it, it opens up to you. The, 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 the pinnacle of isness is God is love. That love, his love fills everything, fills every, every human being. And it's a, it's a one-way love. I, I find this so, so difficult for people to grasp that it's a one-way love. It's not dependent on your acceptance. It's not a, dependent on your request. It's not dependent on your response. It just is because he is, see? He is love. All right, number four, number four, God is breath. God is breath. Um, John chapter four, verse 24, Jesus said that God is spirit. Now that, that's kind of a nebulous whatever, but the word spirit there is the word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, P-N, that's P-N-E-U-M-A, that's right, pneuma. And the, that, that, that word actually means wind or breath. So how, 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 does, how does the Father transfer to us? It's by the Spirit, right? But let, let's put this in a different light. Let's say it's by his breath, by, by the wind. Uh, breath is better because it's, it's much more intimate. So let, let's just stick with breath. God's breath is the agent of transfer. You've got to get this. This is, oh man, this is good. His breath is the agent of transfer of what he is to what you are. A verse that absolutely changed my world was Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, right at the very beginning, at the very beginning of creation. I want you to see this for yourself. Genesis chapter 2 and verse verse 7. This will, this will change your world. Watch this. And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground, Right? And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The life that he breathed into the nostrils of man was his life. Everything that he is, he breathed into man. You were, you were, you were born out of divinity. Can you see that? When he breathed his, his breath into you and you became a living being, what he did was he transferred in that process, to the very first human, and it's the only way it could ever happen, he breathed into that person his very essence. In John chapter 20 and verse 22, it's, breath is divinity's way of transfer. Now just stay with me. In John chapter 20, after the resurrection, in John chapter 20 and verse uh, 22, watch this. John chapter 20. Let me get over here real quick. I want you just, I don't want to lose momentum with you. In John chapter 20 and verse 22, Jesus said this. And when he said this to them, doesn't matter what he said, that's irrelevant for this. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, I got to believe they received it. Well, what about Pentecost? Well, that's another teaching for another day. I just want you to see the transference of the spirit that was within Jesus to the disciples by what he breathed. He imparted through breath. The Father imparted through breath into man his very isness, his very being, his breath. Every, every breath you take, think about this, every breath you take is a witness of God's breath into you or of your divinity. The first breath that a, that a baby takes when it comes out of the womb is an inhale, and then it begins to cry. And when you 
depart out of this, this earth suit, the last breath you take is not an inhale. Nobody dies inhaling. Nobody passes to a higher level of conscious inhaling. It's always exhaling. So you come taking it in and you come exiting out as you move out. So what, what he is, you is. And this is, this is what I want, I'm, I'm really nailing down today. And I, I, I want you to see because this is what we're awakening to. So I hit four, four things very simple of what God is, right? God is, God is light, God is life, God is love, God is spirit, or God is breath. Now watch this. What he is, you is. This is, this is, this is, has to be grasp. I keep saying is. If you got to grab a hold of this. This has to do with no separation and your, your full embrace of image and likeness of the Father. All right. First one, you is light too. He's light. You is light. Foes. Same light. There's, there's no variance. There's no difference in the light that you have within you and the light the Father has. Now, I, I'm, let me bring this back to prayer before we forget our emphasis. This is a matching up of what he is and what you is because this the prayer the prayer is not setting down or kneeling down or shaking your fist or crying out to God it's a, it's a communion it's a spirit to spirit hookup that that lets you as Jesus see Jesus never prayed for anything for himself you can't find one place in scripture where Jesus said father make sure i get the rent money god help me make my donkey payment he he never prayed anything for himself because he didn't have to. He knew what he possessed. He knew that all that the Father had was his. And he knew how to draw out of that. Whether it's go down and get the coin out of the fish's mouth or go over and bring the guy's donkey. He had need of it. He, he knew where his source was. It was in the isness. It was in the tie-up of the isness. All right, 1 John chapter 1. Let's go back there for just a minute. 1 John chapter 1. Let me read two verses out of 1 John. You, you is light. You is light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the, this is the message, I, I read this a little bit ago, which we have heard and declare to you, God is light and in him is no darkness. Now, that's him. Verse 7 is us. But if we walk in the foes, if we walk in it, we realize it. We, we are aware of it. We're conscious of it. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and we have a consciousness and awareness that we have been cleansed from all sin. So there goes sin consciousness. How do you rid yourself of sin consciousness? Some of you today at the Digital Cathedral, you may be weighed down from, from days gone by, years gone by, you did things, uh, got messed up with stuff that you sh now know you never should, but you still feel a burden and a guilt about it. The way you get rid of it, the way you get rid of that darkness is walk in the light. Remember, we don't fight the darkness anymore. I don't fight, I don't fight. I learned in spiritual warfare that as long as I fought, there was a battle. But the instant that I began to shine the light, the truth of who I was into that situation, the darkness dissipated. You are light. You, you, you see your isness and then the days, you see your isness is light and the days of fighting darkness are done. You'll never have to go back to fighting darkness. That's, that's history. That's past. All right, some of, some of you are still questioning a little bit. So let me take you over to John chapter 8. Gospel of John. John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. This is good stuff. Jesus spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me is aware of me, conscious of me, does not walk in darkness, but has the light, the foes, uh, uh, has the light of life. You, you see, you, you get revelation. See, light helps you see. And what he helps you to see is the life that you have. He has the light of life. So what, what allows you to, to know this life that you, you fully possess, this Zoe, this God kind of life in which there is no death, it's the, it's the radiance, it's the illumination of the light that you have from within. Spirit, spirit. Your spirit connects with his spirit. His spirit shows you what you have. Light, light begins to emanate. Light begins to pour out of you. And you, you begin to see this. All right, John chapter 1. Back up just a little bit. This, if this doesn't nail it down, then I can't do any more for you on this light one. John chapter 1, verse 4. John said this. In Jesus was life, and the life, and the life that he had was the light of men. Again, when the light comes on, you see the life. All right, 
So it was the light of men. Now watch this in verse 9. This was the true light. <laughs> this is the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. I'll, I will guarantee you never heard that taught in church. He has a light in every man. Every man has a Jesus light. I, I don't know how you can miss what John said. You need religion to help you misunderstand that verse. Let me read it again. This was the true light which gives, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Hands down, there's absolutely no question about it. Every person that comes into the world, every baby that's born, every person that's walking on the planet today has a Jesus light. So what, what, what's our job? Our job is to flip the switch for people, help them to see what they have. All right, so you, 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 is, you is light. Number two, use life. You are also life. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm, I'm using a lot of scripture this morning because I think I'm treading into some areas that are new to some of you about your prayer life and what it really means to pray. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears. So the life that you have is the life of Christ. The, the word there is Zoe. It's his life. You, you get a revelation of his life, <laughs> You get a revelation of his life, follow me. You get a revelation of his life, you'll get a revelation of your life. I have to have a drink of coffee on that. You can't know who you are until you know that he is your life. Job, way back in Job, he got it. He said, the spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Father has given me life, given me his life, All right? Number, number four, you is love. You is love. Romans chapter five. Back up just a little bit to your left. Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five. This stuff, will, this stuff will change your world. It'll change your life. Romans five. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. The agape of God has been poured out in our hearts. You're, you're going to love with the same love that he loves with because it's been poured into your heart. It's a matter of release. It's a matter of aware. It's a matter of conscience. See, these are the things that we commune about. This is the thing I commune, about, commune with the Father about. I say, Father, I know that I'm filled with your love. So when I walk into that place, I want your love to really shine out. I've got it. I already know that I have it. You'll love with the same love that he has. Didn't Jesus say, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, not by your evangelism, not by your theology being correct, not by the power of your faith or your belief. He said, all men will know that you're my disciples because you pour out agape one to another. So we're, we're learning to love apart from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're learning to love apart from saying that guy deserves love, that guy doesn't deserve love. See, he, he loves Donald Trump the same way he loves Joe Biden. He, he, he loves everybody exactly the same. And we should love them the same as well. Ooh, that hurt, didn't it? Ouch. I stepped on some toes right there. We should love both with the same love of the Father. All right, last one, you is breath. You is breath. Romans chapter 8. While you're right there in Romans, come over a couple pages to Romans 8. And let's look at verse 11. It says, but the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. The word's pneuma, breath of life. L let me put that in there because I think that really hits it well. The breath of life that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. All right? It dwells in you. The, the breath that brought Jesus out of the tomb, the resurrection life, the same breath has burst you from death to life. When you came out of the tomb of Jesus, if we were crucified with him, resurrected with him, what brought you out of the tomb was the breath of life. It was the Father's breath. And remember what we read over in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 25, it says that he gives life, or he gives the breath of life to all. Genesis 2, 7, where he breathes into us the breath of life and we become a living soul. That's not exclusive. That's very in inclusive. So I, I have a lot to say about this point forward. And I want to cover it in more detail next Sunday morning. But the, the power of our breath, the power of what we breathe out. 
every breath you take is a witness to your divinity. Every breath that you breathe out is a witness to that first breath that was breathed into you. It gives testimony as to your origin. It gives testimony to no separation. It gives testimony to your isness. There is no breath but his breath. There's one breath, one life, one God, one Father, one source. There's not two. There's not two. It's the breath of life. There's no other source. Oh my, we've covered a lot. I did a quick overview, and I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't uh, overpower you with that. His light is your light. His life is your life. His love is your love. His breath is your breath. So the entirety of the isness, of his isness, fills you. Now we can see our isness. Now you can understand uh, that verse, those two verses in Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 says that in Jesus dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then it says in verse 10, you're complete in him. So that means all his isness is your isness. Everything he is, you is. There's a completeness. There's a oneness. There's a tie together. This, this is the foundation of prayer, you guys. You guys, this is the foundation of prayer. It's not, it's not trying to get God to see it my way and come do what I think needs to be done. It's not hammering him. It's not bashing every, every morning with the same prayer request. It's, it's, a, it's a realization. It's a coming to an understanding that you walk as he walked and he guides your steps and where you're going today is his plan and his will. And what you need to do, all your prayer time is, is making sure you're connected to him and fellowshipping with him. First Corinthians chapter, chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. And let me read just verse 12. Verse 12 says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God. We've received that spirit from God so that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. All right, now this is, this is going to be op- begin to open up your prayer life. What the communion with him is going to begin to reveal is what you already have. We spent years and years begging for what we thought we needed rather than discovering what we already have. Our divinity has freely given to us because of who that first breath came from when it entered into us. Completeness in him brings a consciousness to us. See, and this is the communion. The communion is a, is a opening. It's a breaking of our consciousness wide open and we can see now what we possess. It keeps you as the branch connected to the vine. I'm, I can't tell you how important this is. I can't tell you. Everything is one with God. He, he is the fullness that fills all things. So when he gave you his light, his life, his love, his breath, he gave you everything that he is. When I just ran through four little is is that he is and I showed you that the same he is you is so in giving that to you in imparting that to you what he's saying is I I'm giving you exactly what I am so we can sit back and we can be like Jesus and we can say and have assurance that everything that the father has belongs to me so let this is the question in your prayer life why are you still asking for things Why are you still trying to get him to do something? Prayer is the face-to-face intimate communion. It's a sharing of light, life, love, and breath. When he breathed into us, we received his mind. We received his life. We received his grace, his passion, his creativity. You're a creator because you have been, his breath contained his creativity. Let that creativity begin to work. Some of you have tremendous uh, uh, talents and you've discovered them. Some of you have abilities and talents you've never discovered that belong to you because of what he possessed. See, Jesus said God is spirit or God is breath and he has breathed into us. So what you need to do every day is breathe in deeply. And as you breathe in, know that you're breathing in your deity, your divinity. Take it all in. Now you maybe can understand John chapter 1, verse 16. 
when John said this, and of his fullness, we have all received. Do you believe that? Just between you and me this morning, just between your, your digital cathedral teacher, pastor, friend, do you really believe that you have received the entirety of his fullness? Hope you can say yes. You might not have uh, discovered it all, awakened to it all, uh, plummeted the potential of it all, but you need to know and you need to, to agree with him that of his fullness you've all received. So if that's a fact, if that's a fact, now here's how it changes your prayer life. Because now you begin to understand that anytime you go outside yourself to get what you think you need for life, then you're not embracing your divinity. You're not embracing your isness. All my prayer time, and it used to be, was going out going outside to get what I thought I needed to get from outside someplace to me. Prayer is not going in, outside. Prayer is not going outside. Prayer is going inside. Prayer is diving deep within to the isness that you possess. And that isness of your spirit, his spirit, matches together. What, what is it you need that doesn't already reside in you? What is it that you can possibly need? If you are filled with all the fullness of God, then what is it that you need that you don't already have? What is it that you will ever need that you don't already have? Prayer is communion. Prayer is connecting what he is to what you is. It's him showing you. It's him revealing to you. It's him shining the light. It's making your light go from a 20-watt bulb to a 100-watt bulb. First Peter, or I mean, Second Peter chapter one and verse three says that he has given us all things that pertain to life, which is all of your natural needs, everything you'll ever need in this world. And he's given us all things that pertain to godliness, that spirit growth, that's development, that pulls out there from the unseen into the seen. That's what prayer does. In that communion time, that, that connectedness, it enables you to pull from what the world that you don't see, which is the real world, that's reality, into this world that is changing continually. If that's, if that's true, if what I'm telling you is true this morning, then what in that old school of prayer, any of those 11 things that I mentioned, what in the world are they to be utilized for? What in the old school of prayer, any of those 11 types that I mentioned, do we need to spend time praying with? We don't. We don't. I'm talking about maturity of sons and daughters. I'm talking about sons and daughters that are growing up. They're still going to be babies that go to their mom and daddy and, and, you know, shake their pant leg for an ice cream cone. There's still going to be people that come into this that have been taught by religion. They think they, they just spend their time praying, begging, pleading God to do something to come where they are. And God is saying, God is saying, man, I'm already within you. The kingdom is within you. What you need is within you. I'm trying to awaken you. I'm trying to make your isness and my isness coincide together so that you are awakened now to all that you possess. See, as we come into this understanding of how infinite the Father really is, we come into an understanding of how infinite we are as his offspring. His infiniteness, he has bestowed and deposited within us. But let me just say it again. We will never know who we are. We will never know the powerhouse that resides within us as us until we know who he is. His isness, and I'm, I'm landing the plane right here. His isness is your isness. So this, this little deposit this morning, this first thing, and I'll, I'll pick it up next week because it, I'm asked this all the time about what is prayer? How, how, how is a grace person? How do I pray? How do I pray now that I believe in the finished work of the cross that everything that he did at the cross provides everything? How do I pray now? I'm telling you how to pray. I'm telling you we hook like Jesus hooked. We, we come into communion with the Father. Jesus spent lots of time in prayer, but he don't by himself. He was communing. He wasn't begging and pleading. I guarantee you that. He was not begging and pleading, asking God to come where he was to meet his needs. And then beating himself with a stick when it didn't show up like he thought he did because he lacked faith or had sin in his life or he was falling short in some area or he was giving up. That never, that never was part of the life of Jesus. 
That is religion. It is religious. It's exhausting. It produces nothing. There's no life in it. There's no zoe. There's no light. There's no breath. But when we flip the script and we begin to understand who he is and who we is, then our prayer life changes. Prayer is a face-to-face -face communion. It's a face-to-face -face encounter. Every time you pray, you're encountering him. You're encountering the one who is with who you is. Amen? Have you got that? All right, let's continue this thought next week. I want you to practice it this week. I want you to do me a favor. If, you, if, you be, if you're an old-time prayer and you're praying all those 11 kinds of prayer and you're hammering heaven, and well, what about what Jesus said, pray, seek, and knock? Look, that's, that's what Jesus was teaching in the old covenant. That's how they were doing it. We come to the new covenant, you don't find Paul ever teaching that. We need to get post-cross in the way that we do things. But I will tell you this, Jesus really exemplified the life of prayer perfectly, perfectly, when he showed us how to, how to connect with the Father. All right, that's it for today. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. We'll see you Wednesday night. We'll talk a little bit more about this Wednesday, and next Sunday morning, we'll take it down another layer because I want all of my people at the Digital Cathedral to be proficient and powerful in the time that they spend in communion with the Father. I want our lives to bear as much fruit as we possibly can. And prayer is a great way to do it, but we have to change the concept in the way that we used to pray to what the Father intends for us to have with Him, which is face-to-face -face communion. God bless you. See you next time.